book of Revelation. And so here we are in Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to read the first six verses to start. The Bible says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, or stars. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, bore her child he might devour it. Very vivid imagery here. Verse 5, she gave birth to a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she was had a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And that is the last, during the last 12, during the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. As we've started this, we've been able to see how that in the Great Tribulation period, the, it starts off as we gave uh, just compelling uh, proof from Scripture that, that there is an idea for this pre-tribulationalist rapture of the church. And, and some believe in the mid-tribulation, some believe in the, the post-tribulation. And, and for those of you who believe in the pan theory, that in the end it will all pan out anyway, um, that's good for you. Um, but, you know, I, like I said with that, I, I will give you probably 90% uh, uh, positive that I believe that it, Jesus will come at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The Bible says in Revelation, uh, at the end of Revelation chapter 3, and the things that are hereafter, which in other words, John is saying the things which are to come. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot more there, though. But anyway, we encounter in this scripture this woman. Now, uh, this is a very... Like I said, the imagery here is very powerful. So who is the woman? Well, I don't think that the woman is the church. Uh, we can be pretty sure of that. The church in Scripture is described as the virgin bride of Christ. Uh, but in Revelation, we have four women that are described. Um, the first one is Jezebel. Of course, we encountered her in Revelation chapter 2 as, as Jesus was talking to us about his church. And the second one is the harlot that we'll get to in Revelation 17 and 18. But then there's this woman that we encounter in Revelation chapter 12. And then also the bride of Christ, which is Revelation chapter 19, verses uh, 19 and chapter 21 as well. So the bride of Christ is always... Um, espoused as the virgin bride of Christ, that she is uh, waiting her to be united with her groom, which is Jesus. And Joseph tells us about who this is, actually, who this woman is, since it's not the church, since it's not the bride of Christ. It is, it is something else. In Gen Genesis chapter 37, uh, verse 5, we have the Meseroth, which is the sign in the stars, the 12 different signs of the zodiac, if you will, if you know it that way today, originally in Hebrew, the Meseroth, and it was the, each one described or was a picture of each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So uh, the woman is Israel, and it seems pretty apparent by who she is and, and what happens here with her. And Israel is described throughout the Old Testament as a woman in travail, ready to give childbirth, as we see this woman here in de depicted in Revelation, and, and we find this prophesied in Isaiah 54, 66, Jeremiah 3, Micah 4, uh, and Micah 5, and just to name a few. And the woman gives birth to this man-child, and the church does not give birth. We don't find that in Scripture um, anywhere. <clears throat> so the woman is Israel, and, and she is not the church. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, Unto us a child is born, a son is given. So the child is born, but the son that relates in elsewhere in biblical prophecy to the promise of God to his church is that the Messiah would come. So we have this, um, this idea that, that the, the, the woman definitely is Israel. And, and Israel is, is, is God's prophetic uh, deliverance during this time and how he is going to bring the message of the gospel uh, to a, a very lost world. Um, Israel uh, appears 75 times in the New Testament in 73 verses. And this doesn't refer to what many might say today, referring to spiritual Israel. For those of you who want to dig up that a little bit, it refers to the literal Israel. So here we have a picture of this woman, Israel, who is getting ready to give birth. And there's a couple characters in, in here that are uh, also uh, described that 
that brings some uh, happening to this and makes some action happen. And before we get into um, all of this, I want to ask you to hold on with me kind of through this Sunday school time as we dissect the prophecy part before we re really get to be able to preach about it. In Romans chapter 9 and, and through 11, Paul stresses that God is not done with Israel. Friends, the Bible tells us as this generation of believers to pray for the peace of Israel, that we have a duty and responsibility to love Israel because she is God's chosen nation and through her came the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, where the gap is, the interval between the 69th and 70th week of years, uh, the 70th week, of course, referring to the, 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 tr the church age and the, the great tribulation period, and, and, and these intervals stress the fact that God is not finished with Israel and that we are called to pray for Israel. And, and the devil, the Bible calls him the devil here, comes from a Greek word which means slanderer. So the devil is out uh, to get the Israel, he's out to get God's chosen people, and, and this uh, child that's born of this woman is, 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 has a, a great um, prophetic meaning for the end of time. So here we have this picture of this woman who is pregnant, ready to give birth, and she gives birth to um, a boy. And uh, the, there's some questions to ask, and I just want to run these by you. How many have studied this portion of scripture? How many have had read books about this portion of scripture? You've uh, done your own research about this portion of scripture. You've always, you know, had this or that. Maybe some of you have different ideas. So the first idea, of course, the, the most glaring one in the face, this man child, who is this boy? Well, is it Jesus? Uh, the Bible does describe him as ruling with a rod of iron. Uh, four times Jesus is referred to in Scripture as the one who rules with a rod of iron. And this is probably the strongest argument of all the arguments that this child is Jesus. But it's not conclusive. And there are three classes of people in Scripture also that are described as ruling with a rod of iron. The Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints at the end as well. But uh, remember, John says at the end of chapter 3, that everything hereafter, so in other words, everything from after chapter 3, after he gets done talking to the churches, everything hereafter is future events. And we've also learned very clearly that Revelation is in chronological order, except for these, uh, this long parenthetical portion and one other parenthetical portion, which is descriptive of what's happening. Like if I were to tell you today that uh, the last Seahawks game that I went to was a long time ago and, and um, um, Glenn was there, but except Glenn didn't get to go into the Seahawks game. He is on the outside of the stadium and I went in and enjoyed the Seahawks loss. And uh, as I was inside there, um, I was enjoying my $20 hot dog and drink and uh, came out and enjoyed the game, and, and Glenn standing on the outside, and he, he tried to listen on the radio, he could do whatever he could, but he was just desperate to find out how the game went, how it really looked. So I was trying to describe it to him, and, and I said, then this happened, then this happened. Well, then I got up, and I had to go get a hot dog, and the guy in the hot dog stand, he wasn't very nice, he didn't have the correct change, so I went back to my, by the time I got back to my seat, my hot dog was cold because the guy walking around saw hot dogs wasn't there. I couldn't find any. So this whole time, uh, amongst the ideas of all the football game and everything that Warren Moon had done, uh, it kind of shows you the date, um, Warren Moon had done during that time was interrupted by my great description of getting a hot dog in the middle of the third quarter. So... That parenthetical portion, the description of the hot dog, also was happening at the same time as the game, but I was describing it to Glenn in such a way as because it was an interruption in my viewing of the game. This is kind of how John is. He is seeing all of the future events unfold in perfect order, then all of a sudden something happens, and, and it's a long descriptive portion, uh, similar to the stuff that God told him not to write down, um, and, and, but he tells him exactly uh, who this is, and uh, this man-child um, could possibly be Jesus. And many prophetic writers write that this is Jesus, but I have another thought, and I want to tell you I won't lose my salvation over it, no, no, neither should you. Another thought is some people think it's the church. But, you know, the problem with that question is the church is not described as ruling with a rod of iron in the Great Tribulation period at all. I have a 
better thought, one that I think may be very plausible. This could be because it's in very descriptive order of Revelation. The 144,000 that God sets aside during this time to be evangelists in the world. The 144,000 people are virgin male Jews, and they are God's anointed evangelists to preach repentance and the message of Jesus to the world during the Great Tribulation, and we, we covered all of this in previous studies. But I have some good questions about this argument, and, and the first one I would ask, number one, if the ascension of Jesus is what is pictured by this man-child's ascension coming up, is it in history, in the history of events that follow his ascension? In other words, everything that we read about from this point on in Revelation doesn't really describe what Jesus' ascension was like when he ascended to heaven the first time, when he was here with his disciples. Now that might sound confusing to some, but how many remember Jesus is on the mountaintop, everybody, there's 500 people saw him alive, remember the Bible says he wandered around for 40 days, and all of a sudden they're all there and they watch him ascend to heaven. Well, the Bible talks about a whole bunch of events that the ascension, whoever is ascended, of things that happened after, which didn't happen after Jesus' ascension at that time. The second question I would say, so I would maybe more discount the idea of Jesus, but number being uh, the man-child, and number two, when did Israel ever flee to a wilderness refuge where God protected and fed her for three and a half years? I don't find that in the history of Scripture where this was Israel prophetically. So that's just a good question. The third question I would have, where in history is the account of an army chasing Israel and the earth swallowing them up? Now we know when they fled Egypt that the Red Sea swallowed the Egyptian army. We understand that. But this is specifically the earth where God took care of Israel for three and a half specific years, 1260 days during this time. Does the idea of the 144,000 fit this verse in verse 17? For those of you scholars, like I said, hang on with me. Let's look at verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Not just one. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. So, there's my two bits. Will it keep you out of heaven if you don't agree with me? No. Will it get you to heaven if you do? No. <laughs> right? Come on now. We can have differing opinions about some of these things. It doesn't, it's not all really important in terms of salvation. But in terms of eschatology, I believe it to be the 144,000. And the reason is because the descriptive of what happens afterward fits what happens to them. Now, the dragon obviously is Satan. Let's read verse 7. The Bible says, now a war rose in heaven. Now, can you imagine this? Satan doing war in heaven. All of a sudden, he picks up his swords. He picks up what he's got. He picks up his third of the fallen heavenly host, the demons, and he goes to heaven, and he's going to make war. This is something new. This hasn't happened like this yet. Notice who's fighting here. This dragon and his army, they go to war. It's not Jesus fighting Satan. I hear this a lot. People always think, that Satan is somehow the antithesis of Jesus, that, that they are just opposites, equal but opposites. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus is God. The Bible proclaims him to be as God. He calls himself God. He fulfills all the divine attributes required for Jesus to be God in the flesh. And so here we have Jesus, God, creator of all things, who created Satan. So this angel gets a taste of the glory of God, steward of the throne of God, sitting over the throne of God, the leader of the worship in heaven. The, all, he's got all this glory being presented to himself, and he gets a taste of it, and some things begin to happen. Haven't you ever wondered about this crazy Satan? Why in the world, if he knows he's defeated, that he is still fighting? <coughs> Anybody ever wondered that? What drives this guy? I mean, what is pushing this guy to, to certain doom and eternal punishment? I mean, well, he could be crazy. Okay, that's one thing. I, I see a lot of this going on. I, I, the, but, you know, the Bible tells us that since the cross, Satan is defeated. 
That means every burden that you've borne, everything, every sin that you've ever struggled with in life, Jesus paid for that on the cross. He is going to do no more to save you. He's done it all. His Holy Spirit speaking out loudly and boldly and clearly, compelling you to draw closer to him in fellowship. The cross established forever your healing, your eternal salvation that God has touched and put within each and every one of us that calls him Lord and pursues him with all of our heart. So God has given us this great gift since the blood was shed on the cross. Satan is defeated. So what in the world is this lunatic thinking? If we've ever asked, maybe we just think, well, maybe he's just mean. I mean, I've known some mean people. How many know some mean people? I've known some mean people, right? And they're just mean. And you wonder, what in the world happened to that person to make them so mean? Well, I can tell you one thing that does happen, and it happens in the heart of a child, right? When we have children, if we discipline too much too early, rebellion. If we discipline too late, too little, rebellion. And what happens with rebellion The base sin of all things, the first thing that Satan fell to of all things, was pride. Now, pride pride is a big thing. I have it up here. This is my... Maybe I don't. I don't have it. Okay, so the first thing he falls to is pride. His, His role here, maybe it's on your outline, but not on the PowerPoint. That's my fault. So Satan's role before the glory of before the before the fall, as I mentioned, is his pride was so deceptive that one third of heaven actually agrees with to follow him. Now, if Bernie Sanders got a third of the vote, he'd be probably pretty happy. But Satan gets one third of the vote. And who knows about Rubio, Cruz, and Trump? We have no idea about those guys. Don't read him, don't read any liberal leanings in my part. I'm quite the opposite. But the whole idea of the, this pride coming in, pride is a powerful thing. In fact, it's so powerful, uh, we learn from Scripture that it is the source of all contention. Proverbs 13.10, do I have that? I don't have that either. Pride only breeds quarrels. Listen to this. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. By, by pride, I think the King James says, only by pride, only by pride comes contention. So if there's contention in any way, on any level in our life, it's because pride is a factor. Pride is right there. Pride does some other things, too. And the next one on your outline, it it hardens our heart toward God. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 20 tells us that that King Nebuchadnezzar's heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, and and his throne was taken away from him. It is from, from such a prideful place that atheists are born. Psalm chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. In other words, God doesn't believe in atheists. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. It will harden our heart toward God. It takes away the the ability for us to to have um, a freedom to approach his throne of grace. When our heart is hard toward God, it's hard to hear him speak. We don't want to hear him speak. We, we enjoy being miserable. How many have ever met somebody like that? It seems like they enjoy being miserable. Why are you miserable all the time? I mean, I've been accused of being that way in the past. As I had to reflect on my own life saying, man, I really am miserable all the time. Why am I so miserable? I, have, I know Christ. I shouldn't be miserable all the time. But that pride comes in, and it, 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 because it's all the source of contention, it hardens our heart toward God. In fact, the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar was brought lower than, than degraded because of his attitude of his heart. Hosea chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 speaks of pride sucking the life out of Ephraim. And Ephraim, the, the place, the community, the name Ephraim means double fruit. It says the life is taking from your fruit. The life is coming out of you. Pride does that to you. Some other things pride does, and it's in your outline, I think it'll hinder our spiritual growth. Scripture says in Proverbs 26, 12, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Man, that's pretty sad scripture. If we're arrogant in our own way, we we think we've got it all figured out. You know, I was young, am, still, a little bit. It seems like the older I get, the more and more God has opportunity to knock the pride right out of me. 
And it seems like we, we get to know the place where we think we know a bunch, and all of a sudden God comes in with something else, and he says, that you don't think you know, you don't know as much as you think you know. And he begins to take us, take us through the walk that we so desperately need, that discipline that he gives to us. But it hinders our spiritual growth. It takes us to a place where we can't grow in our faith. What a dangerous place to be in. Somebody who's proud against authority, proud against the advice of people, proud against the advice of their spouse, proud especially and foremost from the word of God. It hinders us from coming to God. Psalm 10.4, the Bible says, In his pride the wicked do not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. Pride pushes out our ability to have room for the wisdom of God. Another thing that it does in your outline, it causes us to deceive ourselves. I'm sure that you've heard it said that if you tell yourself a lie long enough, after a while you'll believe that it's true. In Jeremiah 49, verse 16, God says that the people had built themselves homes in high places in the cleft of the rocks, and because they thought that they were safe. So now that we've built our, our, our caves and our dwelling places up in these rocks, we're going to be safe. We don't have to worry about the enemy. They told themselves that through their actions, because of what they did, they're safe, that, that God had nothing to do with it. And, of course, God brought them quickly to ruin. The calamity, even amongst their communities, was disrupted, and, and the enemy came in, and the Midianites wiped them out, to, oh, nearly wiped them out. And another thing that pride does is it leads us to ruin. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Bear to be lowly in spirit among the oppressed and to share the plunder of the proud. Arrogance, pride, takes away the ability to build, construct, to put together. It tears down. Someone that's prideful always is, is quick to criticize without finding a solution. Uh, someone who's prideful is, 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 is less apt to participate in worship and to engage in the things of God because they know better. They've been there already. They've experienced, so they don't need. And God says, you know what? It's going to lead you to ruin. It's going to stump your spiritual growth. You better get rid of pride. And this first thing that Satan fell to was the baseline foundation for everything else because once the castle of, pr of pride is fortified around somebody's life, they can't see the truth. I have talked to people sometimes till I'm blue in the face, but because of their pride and their arrogance and they're stuck in their evil ways and they're stuck in the things that they're stuck in, they don't have a licking care about anything that I have to say. They won't hear anything I'm telling them. And sometimes I've been on the other side of that fence, too. More often than I'd like to admit. But when we're filled with pride, we don't want to hear what others say. We, we don't want to listen to what might be true because we've already made up our mind. Another thing Satan knows of pride, he fell to pride. Once that foundation was laid, he knew something about God's word that maybe many Christians ought to be aware of. He knew that if he can stop the church from praying, he's won. Because in his mind, he knows that if he can wipe out the remaining believers who are seeking him or who are praying for Israel, for the peace of Israel as God commands his church to do, and to come to Christ, then he has won. In other words, if Satan can wipe out the church's spiritual fervor uh, to seek God for souls and are, were eager for Jesus' return, in his mind he has won. And he has, hasn't he? If he has taken away the spiritual fervor and, and the veracity that God's people have to seek him and worship him and love him with all of our heart, what Satan has done is he has taken the cake. He has won even if he loses. The rapture is... A secret, I believe, in Scripture because God wants to catch Satan by surprise. I know that almost everything else is revealed for those who want to do their homework in Scripture about prophecy except the rapture. It is that one thing that is a mystery. And, and, and if Satan knows this, one, this last thing, he knows another thing, pride. He knows that um, uh, the, he, if he gets to church from stop praying is one. He knows the third thing, but he knows the clock is ticking. Romans 11.25 says, until the number of Gentiles comes in. In other words, there's a clock in heaven. There's a clicker, if you will. Every time someone crosses the finish line in heaven, God has another clicker. Because God has a predetermined number, apparently, according to Scripture, that when that number is met, then all of the sudden, the, the, he is coming for his church. So that clicker is going. God's sitting there. He's got an angel probably doing that. That's just little work, right? 
He's got a busy thumb. And, and as the days get longer and the Bible tells us that the hearts of most will grow cold because of the increase in wickedness in the world, maybe it's getting a little slower. I don't know. I would hope that in our generation, in our day, with the, around the world, maybe not so much in America as we don't see anymore as much, but around the world that it's getting faster. And that as the gospel is being preached to the world, that clicker is going off because the Bible says, until the full number of Gentiles come in. In other words, God's opening this grace. He's spreading his grace out among the world, and he's calling to whoever will listen to come and find me, to come and be my children, to come and experience salvation, to come and enjoy the Holy Spirit, to come and enjoy the fellowship of the church of the saints of believers that are also seeking God with you. So this clicker's clicking, and yet the time is going on, and, and the numbers are getting full, more full, and so Satan's going to fight all the harder. He's going to do whatever he can to distract God's people from seeking him, for diving in, becoming fully 100% sold out in Christ. And what that means, he's going to put a lot of distractions in front of our eyes. There's going to be more screens. We're going to have more things on our, than our phone here soon. I'm, I'm guaranteed that um, somebody sent me something here. Um, good, Pizza Hut. We can get a deal on Pizza Hut today. So I'm glad that I looked at that. We're going to be looking at more stuff. We're going to become more and more distracted by the toys that we can get and the things that we can have. And, and anymore, there's no more uh, going out and doing stuff. You know, like we used to, it's sitting at home and seeing what's on Netflix for our latest binge watch. So he'll do whatever he can to take away our time. Every time someone comes to Christ, the timer of the bomb is ready to go off. So Satan is uptight. He's anxious, and who knows, this morning, if you've been waiting to make your full commitment to Christ, maybe it's your fault that it's all been held up. <laughs> maybe the moment you step over that line, the rapture's going to happen. Until the full number of Gentiles come in. Until the full number. God has a number. He's already picked it. He's already chosen it. Revelation 12.10, reading on. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. I love this. You know what it's like to be accused of something, right? And if I could build for you on this stage here, envision a grand courtroom. Of course, the best lawyer, Matt Locke, is over here with his gray suit on, and the, 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 the chorus is set. Every cast member is in their place. We've got over here, we've got the bench here with all of the jury, all of the people are sitting here. We've got the judge sitting at uh, Roy's beautiful blue drum set, and he's high up there. He's sitting, God the just judge, and on this side we have the accuser, and we have Satan, and he's over here, and he's spewing lies at the other side of the bench, and he is saying, you know what Cody did? You know what Cody did? Look at he's picked up chicks. <laughs> yes, I did. He did. He picked up chicks. You know what else? He, he lied that one time. He forgot. Wasn't that terrible? Thank you, Cody. You can sit down. He did this terrible stuff, and he's got all every single one of us on the other side of the courtroom, doesn't he? And what he's doing, he's accusing us. And Revelation 12, 10 is a powerful scripture because it says that that accuser is cast down. This war that he wanted to fight in heaven, this third had grabbed up all of his dirty angels that he could, and he went to heaven, and he tried to fight, and he couldn't win, so he's thrown down. The, the accuser, the Bible says, of our brethren, you and I that belong to Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and he is over here, and he is doing his best to make the case. And we, we can stand here all that we want, and we can feel guilty, right? Friends, some of us do that. Some of us, we stand here, and we hear all the lists of things that Satan has against us. The time that we failed, we failed our children, maybe we failed our spouse, we failed in our finances, we failed in life in so many ways. And all of a sudden, we're over here, and we're hanging our head, and we're downtrodden, and, the, and life has drained us and got us down, and Satan has used life just to twist into us is this cruel, uh, uh, take away all the serenity and peace that we have, just whatever he can do to just grind at us and, and get at us. And, and what is happening over here, if we're not careful, is we'll begin to believe all those stupid lies. You know, the Bible says that when he opens his mouth, lies are his native language. 
So no matter what he says, what he's saying, he's lying. When he's talking to you and he's telling you all that stuff, because as Paul writes, that's what some of you were. But now you are justified. Now you are sanctified. Now you are new creatures in Christ, he says. That's what you were. That's what I was. All of a sudden, all those accusations come up and our lawyer comes up. And one thing Jesus hands to us is this card that says grace on it. And that's all that it took. Because no longer does God the Father see all the grossness of sin that that accuser has thrown in our life. All he can see is the blood applied to that one standing there. He can only see his son's blood. It's only through Jesus that we have access to his throne of grace. Pretty good preaching. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Praise God. <laughs> oh, boy. Pride. <laughs> the Bible says one thing I, I want to add about this is that he's always accusing day and night. All the time. Verse 11. And they have conquered him, check out the conquering part, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows, excuse me, his time is short. How did they overcome? By the blood. Hallelujah, that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, and it is through that, as Scripture says, propitiation, that intervention, that overshadowing of our sin, that because of that blood, that we trust in, that Jesus shed for us on the cross, he became the sacrifice. How does that work? Well, from the beginning, God, uh, uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and they rebelled against God's will, so what does God do? He, he kills animals himself. God killed the first animals, and he, and he took the skins off animals, and he covered their nakedness. And he said, from now on, I'm going to establish this covenant with you. Whenever you uh, sin, every, once a year, I want you to bring these sacrifices of blood to illustrate a covering for your sin. The Bible tells in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 10, 9 and chapter 10, that God himself sent Jesus in human likeness, in human flesh, for sin, to become sin for us. In other words, now that that blood has been shed, that old covenant is no longer valid. We have a new covenant in Christ. So the blood, they trusted in the blood, they trusted in Jesus. Number two, by the word of their testimony, they were unashamed and very willing to share the hope that is in Christ, and they loved not their lives to death. You know, these qualities are all things that God calls his people to embrace, that this is something that God wants us to hold on to. And, and friends, we're called to abandon everything else in life and follow him. That is the cost of salvation, the great exchange for our, our dead, dried up life, for a new life in Christ. And he calls us to himself to walk in him by his great mercy and, li and then live for him in his grace. His grace is sufficient. A grace that is not contingent on your works and how well you behave. A grace that is just there. If grace could be earned, then it's not grace. A grace that writes the same name, your name, in that eternal book of life, the Bible says. The Bible talks about this book and as it relates to Revelations. And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 31, Moses is praying. The people have sinned. Listen to what he says. He's got a tremendous heart for his people. But Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Could you imagine making a statement like that? Now, Moses must really love these people a lot. I don't know if I could say that for you. I'm just being honest. I'm not sure you could say it for me. Would you trade your salvation? Paul writes it about his people, the Jewish people. He says, if I could be cut off from Christ so that they could be saved, I would do it. It's an impossible equation, of course. It's not even an accurate figure. It's not a good illustration. But Paul says, if I could, and Moses says the same thing. If, if God, you just blot my name out of the book that you've written. The book's been around since before the New Covenant, before eternity. In verse 33, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Notice the word 
blot, and written. We have a verb form of blot, but we don't find the verb form of written. It kind of makes me wonder that God's already written the book of life, but the names can be blotted out. Daniel chapter 12, and verse 1, At the time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Revelation talks about this book. Is your name in the book? Don't wait to get your name in the book. It's what God has that's set aside, and, and he has uh, the name of every person that's accepted his and him and his grace to come to him. And he's written that name in that book. And if your name is not found in the book of life, when that great day of judgment comes, all these horrible things we've been talking about coming on the earth during the great tribulation, then, friend, you will not be allowed into heaven. Finally, wrapping up the chapter, these last five verses, verse 13, the Bible says, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the man child, but the woman was given two, uh, two wings of a great eagle that she might fly from the serpent in the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, time, and half a time. The serpent poured water like, and that's uh, 1260 days, by the way, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came up and held to the help of the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And he stood in the sand of the sea. Now we'll be talking about some more of that next week as we get into the next chapter 13 and on. But there's so much beautiful stuff here and so much uh, angry stuff. We find this, this dragon pursuing what I believe are these evangelists, uh, and he's going to try to stomp out the witness of them. He's going to try to pursue them. Or, uh, no, by no means, if that's not your interpretation, the very least of e either of those three interpretations, Jesus, the church, or the 144,000, he's going to try to stamp out the message of Jesus. He is going to try to dissolve that idea of Jesus entirely, of the grace of God and the goodness of God. So i got to ask you, with all this being said, once again, are you sure your name is in the book? You know, there's a song years ago by a Christian rock band named White Hart that I used to like. And the name of the song was Read the Book, Don't Wait for the Movie. <laughs> I can still remember, read the book, don't wait for the movie. You know. <laughs> Those are good. Aaron, you remember that one? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pam does. Pam does. Praise God. Stand with me, would you? I'm going to ask our worship band to come back. One last thing, and then we're going to receive communion together. Jesus, I thank you so much for your grace today, and I praise you for everyone that's standing in this room. We pray, Lord, that we would not leave this place remiss without asking if we have our name written in that book. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and fill this place with your conviction and your love, the love of Jesus. Jesus, have your way in us today. We love you so much as a church family. And we pray, God, right now that during these few moments that we'd be able to turn to you and run to you with all of our heart. Friends, without looking around, I want to ask you a very powerful question, a personal one. If you're here and you aren't sure if your name is written in that book, the book of life, I want to let you know that you can be certain of that. You can be sure of it today. Don't let the accuser accuse you any longer in his courtroom of fabricated things. That's what you were. Step into the light of Christ today. Anyone here would just simply lift your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I recognize that my name may not be in that book, and I want to make sure. Just slip your hand up and down. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you. Four, five, six. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Hallelujah. What a tremendous response this morning. Those of you that lifted your hands along with the rest of us, I want to ask you to pray in your own way. Sometimes we lead a prayer that's scripted or I ask you to pray after me or say what I say. But your prayer needs to have kind of three ingredients. Number one, accept the fact that you're a sinner. Accept the fact that you've crossed that line of God's grace. And you want to make sure that you're in his kingdom. And secondly, that second point is 
to believe, the ABCs of salvation, believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Friends, he did. And he's coming back again for a church of people looking for him. And then the last one, C, confess that to him. Say, Lord, I confess that to you. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you're Savior. And then accept him as that Lord. So would you just pray right now in your own words and your own way with those ingredients. Just talk to the Lord like you would talk to me. Lord Jesus, I come to you. I just ask you to forgive me. I, I, I just accept the fact that I've sinned, that I've run from you, and that, that I'm, I, I, I need your grace. I need your forgiveness, Lord. For